In this lecture, I'm going to talk about custodianship of mineral resources, or you can think of it more colloquially as ownership of mineral resources. The lecture is going to focus on access to mineral resources in the United States, both resources at the surface and below the surface, and I'll finish by giving some discussion of access to mineral resources globally. I want to first draw your attention back to this slide which you saw earlier in the class when we talked about different types of ore deposits and how they formed. And as a reminder, the 1849 gold rush in California, all of that gold as shown in the map on the right side of your screen was located in what we call placer gold deposits. And these were gold deposits where rivers washed gold from the high mountains in the Sierra Nevada in eastern California down towards the Pacific Ocean and as the velocity of water decreased, gold settles to the bottom along the inside of meander bends in the river. So this is something you've seen before when we talked about placer gold deposits. And it drove a population boom in California. So on the bottom I've got from 1900, if we go back to 1849, the population was effectively zero European residents of California. And just to give you a sense of the population growth of California, it was largely due to the placer deposits. And you can see that here with the inset, 1849 in green for San Francisco. San Francisco was the port where much of that gold was put on ships and exported. So how did people get access to that land? At that time, California, if you look at the map lower right, California was part of the Mexican Cession. It was not a state. It was not part of the United States. And you can think of the miners in that part of the middle of the 19th century were essentially squatting on land they did not own. So when the gold rush began here in the central part of California, just east of San Francisco, it drew tens of thousands of people from around the world, most from Europe, the eastern United States, parts of Canada, who flocked to California to mine the gold and make their fortune. And some of the gold shown here in the bottom image is what they would find along the river bottoms. It was low-hanging fruit, easy to pull from the river bottom sediments, and easy to sell because it was almost already pure gold. So what happened when all of these people moved into that part of California is informal rules evolved among the miners in terms of who had access to land, who owned the land. After the U.S. Civil War ended in 1865, representatives in the U.S. House of Representatives in Washington, D.C., from the Midwest and Eastern states, petitioned to take back the land and have the U.S. government mine and return the revenue to the Treasury. So there was an interest on the part of people from Midwest and Western states for the United States to take ownership of all of this land and allow the mining to happen, but for all of the revenue to be returned to the United States Treasury. Western politicians at the time argued that miners were important for developing the land. They viewed this as the right of immigrants to develop that land, to create wealth, and therefore they wanted no laws that discouraged Western migration. In fact, they wanted the opposite. They wanted the federal government to allow individuals to have access to the land so that individuals could stake ownership of the land, mine the metals from that land, and use that revenue to essentially develop Western states for the betterment of the Union as a whole. So in 1864, Congress, Congress agreed with these Western politicians, and essentially, as I've quoted here, they let the miners have the land. Now, as a result, in 1872, Congress passed, the United States Congress passed what we now call the Mining Law of 1872. And that mining law gave miners the rights to claim land for the purpose of mining metals such as copper, gold, mercury, silver, and other valuable deposits. Now what's important here is that the metals that are covered by the mining law of 1872 are what you can think of as hard metals in rock. And this is going to be different, as I'll explain today, from very large volume mineral deposits such as oil and natural gas and a select few others.
So the images I show here on the left, when we think of the mining law of 1872, we're thinking about gold and silver and copper and even mercury that exists in ore deposits in California. It is a liquid at ambient temperature, but it is covered under the mining law of 1872. And by the way, as of 2020, the mining law of 1872 still stands and is the governing legislation for mining hard rock metal deposits in the United States. So what does it mean? How does it actually regulate access to land? I'm going to walk through a series of slides and I want you to simply think about a person shown here in the photograph who finds a rock shown here in the photograph and within that rock there may be the metal gold. So in this case this is a rock that geologists refer to as a vein much like a vein that runs through your arm and in geologic systems the gold in this vein deposited from waters that moved through this part of the Earth's crust tens of millions of years ago. Geologists refer to this as a vein or a load claim and they're synonymous with one another. So when we say load, we mean vein. When we say vein, we mean load. You're probably asking why we need two terms. I don't know. It's just how geologists do it. So what the mining law of 1872 allows individual citizens to do or companies to do is to claim land that is owned by the federal government. That's important. If the land is owned by the federal government, an individual can claim that land for the purpose of extracting the metals within the land. And they file a mining claim, and here was, here's an example of what a mining claim might look like, and there's more paperwork, but just to give you an example of what the first part of the paperwork looks like. Now, one of the things that's very important with respect to the mining law of 1872, I'm gonna show you here, and then on several subsequent slides, make sure you understand it's important. Imagine we have two landowners, we have, well, let's imagine we have all of the land here is owned by the federal government, and we have two surveyors, two miners. This miner on the left, over the land shown in red, trips over this ore deposit that intersects the surface. And that ore deposit that intersects the surface is a load or a vein, and it, it extends from the surface below the surface as this gray body that I've outlined here. So this gray body contains lots of gold, and that gray body is the vein containing sulfide minerals, and those sulfide minerals contain gold. Now imagine we have a second person over here, and that person is standing on top of all the land indicated in black. If the person on our left files a claim for this land in red, so the land is owned by the federal government, this person files a claim for the land owned in red, and they start mining, this vein, they have the sole right to mine the vein below the surface, building an underground infrastructure, and they can continue mining it all the way here, even if this person on our right has filed a claim for the surface land here. The portion of the vein underneath the second in black, the second person's claim, is known as the extralateral part of the vein, and it extends beneath the surface of another landowner. So the owner of the land over here who's filed a claim, he has no ore deposit that intersects the surface, and he cannot by law dig underground and mine this part of the vein, the extralateral part of the vein, because that is owned by extension by this person here who filed the claim on this part of the land. So the way that this works, now we look at a different image of showing how this works. Each citizen or resident can claim land where a vein intersects the surface and one claim is for a piece of land at the surface that's 600 feet wide on the end by 1,500 feet on a side. So it's a rectangle, 600 by 1,500 feet. And they claim this land because there's a vein that intersects the surface. And again, notice that as the vein descends below the surface, if that vein descends and then actually the extralateral part is underneath another person's claim, 
only the person who has the claim to this land legally has the right to build an underground infrastructure and mine the extralateral part of that vein. When you file a claim and your claim is approved, you're required to stake out all of the corners of your claim and post signs here indicating that that land is now a registered mining claim. And you can use different types of stakes. So some people can use stone mounds, you can use wood posts, you can use metal posts, and there are a variety of different types of posts or mounds that you can use. In order to legally claim the land, once your claim is approved, you simply have to post this and put your name, and then on the bottom here is the federal claim number. And once you have that federal claim approved, no one else can mine the vein at the surface or the extra lateral part of the vein that extends at depth below someone else's claim at the surface. There's no limit to the total number of claims. So you can file as many claims as you want for load or veins. I mentioned extra lateral rights, and again, just make sure you understand what that means. If you have a claim to this land surface here, and you start mining the vein at the surface, you can build an underground infrastructure to continue mining it at depth. And let's say I own the claim directly next door. If that vein does not intersect the surface of my claim, I cannot build an underground infrastructure and access that mineral. The mining law of 1872 has what we call the prudent man concept built into it. And I know the gender here is archaic, but what the prudent man concept indicates is that when you file a claim, you have to actually intend to mine the resources on that land. You cannot file a claim simply to get access to the land to build a vacation home. So this prudent man concept, that dictates or requires by law that you intend to mine resources from that land. In 1872, when the law was enacted, it allowed for individual claims after five years to become patented. And what that meant is that if you filed a claim on land and you started mining that land, after five years, you could apply to the federal government for a patent, and they would literally transfer ownership of the land or the title to the land to you. And then you would own that land in perpetuity. And this was written into the Mining Law of 1872 as what was thought at the time a way to incentivize immigration and westward expansion. That patent was a moratorium was put on it in 1994 because there were more than a hundred years of people abusing that system where people would file a claim, they would not mine on the land, they would file a patent, and the goal was clearly simply to gain ownership of the land. So in 1994, the U.S. Congress put a moratorium on patents and you're no longer allowed to apply for them. So now let's switch to a second type of claim which applies to placer deposits. So now we've got, here are the placer deposits in an image you've seen before, where we've got river water flowing from the top of your screen to the bottom. And as the water flows around the inside of these meander belts, as I mentioned earlier, gold, because it's much denser than water, settles to the bottom. And on geologic time scales, significant quantities of gold can accumulate. Placer claims are also part of the Federal Mining Law of 1872. They're different from load claims in that for placer claims, an individual, a resident, or a company, each placer claim can be 20 acres per locator, so per person, with a maximum acreage of 160 acres, meaning that one person could file a claim for eight 20 acre parcels of land, and then another person would have to file a claim for additional land if there were an attempt by one family or a company to accumulate significant amount of land. But one person alone can file a claim for a placer deposit and has a maximum of 160 acres. And again, you also have to stake out your claim. You have to post 
signs that let people know you have the federal claim for that land. Patenting was possible until 1994, and again in 1994, the U.S. Congress put a moratorium on patents. There's a cost to mining metals on federal land, and it is very inexpensive. If you file a claim for land owned by the federal government, you pay rent of $1 per acre per year. You pay a processing fee. Think of that as a paperwork fee. You pay a $40 location fee where they use GPS today to actually map the latitude and longitude of the four corners of your claim. You pay an initial maintenance fee to the federal government, and then you continually pay a maintenance fee each year that you have the claim for that land. Again, the words at the bottom are more of what I've said already in today's lecture. The Mining Act was designed to, to encourage westward expansion, and it has suffered a lot of criticism over the last 150 years. And that's because it gave individuals exclusive rights to mine as much metal as they could find on federal land and pay a pittance or a very small amount of money to the federal government. And importantly, they paid no federal royalty. And you can think of royalty here as synonymous with tax. So all of the metals were on land originally owned by the federal government of the United States. Individuals would file a claim for that land. They would extract the metals. So yes, it was their sweat equity and it was their financial resources that actually covered the costs of mining, and they were able to keep effectively almost 100% of the revenue from mining. This is why there is a lot of criticism, and even today, there are a lot of environmental groups and others who are pushing the U.S. Congress to change the requirements to claim land for the purpose of hard rock mining, placer claims and load claims. If we go back to 1872 and we look at the total amount of mined metals, it's in the hundreds of billions of dollars. And all of that wealth has been transferred from land owned by the government to individuals. And that's why there's a lot of criticism because the federal government, in essence, is viewed as having simply given away those resources. The U.S. government owns a significant amount of land throughout the United States. And as the map shows here, even greater amounts of land in the western states. Of all of the land in the United States, the federal government owns about 30% of that land. And within the federal government, there are a number of federal agencies that manage that land. The Bureau of Land Management, the United States Forest Service, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, and the United States National Park Service. You don't need to memorize these acreages here, but just note how much land is owned by the federal government and the four agencies that help manage that land. In terms of mineral resources, the Bureau of Land Management manages all of the federal government's onshore subsurface mineral estate, which is about 700 million acres. So anyone who wants to file a claim for any land shown here on the map in red, you have to file a claim with the Bureau of Land Management. And as I highlight here, and I'll touch on in a future slide, in much of the United States, even below the surface, if private landowners own the surface, the federal government retains legal ownership of mineral resources below the surface. I'll also highlight that the Bureau of Land Management also controls access to mineral resources on land owned by Native American tribes throughout the United States. One of the things that is seemingly unique about land ownership for the purpose of extraction of resources in the United States is what I call here or what is called split estate ownership. And what split estate ownership means is that you might own a house and you might own the land on which that house is built. But below the surface, if there are mineral resources, which might include copper or gold or oil or natural gas, it is possible in the United States 
to separate ownership of the surface from ownership beneath the surface. When that is not done, we refer to it as a unified estate. And a unified estate means that one person or one entity owns the rights to the surface and also owns the rights to mine any minerals below the surface. When we have a split estate, it means that one person or group owns the rights to the surface, but the mineral rights below the surface have been severed from the surface rights. This is unique in United States law where we distinguish the surface rights from the mineral rights. And in most cases, what it means is that if you own the surface but do not own the mineral rights, a company that wants to get access to the minerals below the surface, below your surface land, has to negotiate with you for a right-of-way to come in and build an infrastructure to access the mineral rights below the surface. It's one of the things that you want to check for if you ever buy a home. When you go through the closing process for a home, there is literally part of the contract that indicates whether or not the mineral rights are split estate or unified estate. So tuck that away, and if at some point in your life you buy a home somewhere that has once been federal land, it's something to check. A second unique feature of U.S. law with respect to mineral resources derives from the Stock Raising Homestead Act of 16, 1916. And the Stock Raising Homestead Act was also enacted by the federal government to encourage more westward expansion. And what the law allowed is for individual settlers to claim up to 640 acres or 260 hectares of non-irrigable land, meaning land that could not be planted with corn or wheat or another similar crop. And that land had been designated by the United States Secretary of the Interior as stock raising. And by stock, if you look at the photograph on the right, think cattle. So this really opened up the Midwest and western part of the United States for individuals to move west, that westward migration from the east coast of the United States. And what the federal government did is they allowed individuals to claim the surface, 640 acres, but the federal government retained the right to all the mineral resources below the surface. So this is another example of the split estate. Here, individuals can own the surface. Here, individuals can also own the surface, but the government owns the right to the minerals below the surface. So now let's talk about the second law that was enacted in the United States to, to control access for the purpose of extraction of natural resources. In 1920, the United States Congress signed into law the Federal Mineral Leasing Act of 1920. And different from hard rock natural resources, such as load or vein claims or placer claims, the Federal Mineral Leasing Act of 1920 is used for resources such as oil, which is a liquid, natural gas, which is a gas, and resources such as phosphate, sulfur, potash, salt, and coal that are all solid, but all of these, in addition to oil and natural gas, occupy very large volumes of the Earth's crust. So if you look at the map here on the lower left, what is outlined here, and I'm tracing it out with my laser pointer, what is outlined here in sort of black-orange throughout the Midwest and the Rocky Mountain regions of the United States up to the Canadian border and then notice here also in California, these are areas with large subsurface accumulations of oil. The same kind of oil you might think of putting in a combustion engine vehicle, crude oil. And all of this crude oil exists hundreds of meters below the surface, and all of that crude oil is owned by the federal government. So someone may own the surface, but the federal government owns all of the resources below the surface. Now, why does the federal government own all of that oil? And this is sort of a question I have here in blue. Why would the federal government create legislation controlling access to land that contains oil? And 
The hint I'll give you here, and then just give you a little bit of an historic perspective about why the federal government owns all this land. If we think of coal and oil as energy resources, on the right-hand side, the amount of energy embodied in coal and embodied in oil is shown here in megajoules per kilogram, and then translated to kilowatt hours. You've been working now in the modules in discussion with, with electricity. And so let's just talk about kilowatt hours. If I have coal, and I have a kilogram of coal, and I combust that coal, meaning I burn that coal, the amount of energy released, because burning coal is an exothermic reaction, the amount of energy released is enough to generate seven kilowatt hours of electricity. Now compare that to a kilogram of oil. If I have a kilogram of oil, and I combust that oil, or burn that oil, I also stimulate an exothermic reaction, and that kilogram of oil is enough to produce 13 kilowatt hours of electricity. We refer to this as energy density. So the energy density is the amount of energy that can be released by the combustion of or burning of a particular fossil fuel. And notice that oil has twice the energy density of coal. So why would that play a role in the federal government controlling access to all of the oil across the United States? It goes back to the late 1800s, early 1900s. And World War I plays a pivotal role. So if you go back and you look at the world's navies in the very late 1800s, this is the British, British HMS Illustrious. And the navies around the world, they burned coal to liberate the energy within coal, the exothermic reaction. And they used that energy that was released to convert water to steam to drive propellers to move ships across the world's oceans. In World War I, it became obvious that using coal was a major problem. And that's because, as you can see here with this German battleship, the Posen, if you look here, this is a chimney at the center of the ship, and you can see all the soot that's coming out of that chimney. Remember last lecture we talked about dilution is the solution to pollution? Well, here you can see all of that soot that is the byproduct of combusting coal down here in the furnaces in the ship, and all of that soot made you stand out. So one of the things that the navies recognized is that by burning coal during daylight hours, they would become extremely visible for the ships of other navies because this plume of soot would essentially rise tens to hundreds of feet in the air and stand out on the horizon. So it made you a very obvious target. Now, if we look at that time, and we think about the world's navies going into World War I. All the navies around the world used coal. And as the video shows here, you've got members of the Royal Navy who are scooping out coal, putting it into bins, and then loading it onto ships. And coal-powered battleships required a lot of coal, up to 10 tons of coal every single hour. And as I mentioned, would produce this dense smoke filled with ash. Okay, that was a major problem. It also meant that ships could not be out at sea for very long periods of time because they would exhaust quickly the amount of coal on board and they'd have to return to a port in order to resupply the ships. Now, again, I mentioned energy density. So on the y-axis, just think of it as low energy, high energy density. And just again, we compare crude oil to a variety of different types of coal. And remember that oil has a much higher energy density than coal. So along comes Winston Churchill. And Winston Churchill is famous for many things. Among them, he actually wrote all of the speeches that he ever gave. He was an amazing orator. And what Winston Churchill noticed in World War I when he was first Lord of the Admiralty, is he noticed that his ships that were fighting Germans in the Atlantic Ocean and in the English Channel, his ships were easily visible and they could not stay out at sea for very long. So what Winston Churchill proposed, here I say this in text, he proposed 
that the British Navy convert all of their ships from coal to oil because oil has a much higher energy density. So for the same mass, the same kilograms of oil relative to the same kilograms of coal, oil burning ships could stay at sea for twice as long. He also did tests that indicated that oil burning ships created less smoke, which made them less visible. Oil burning ships also required less manpower. So it was almost like a trifecta. Oil produced less smoke. Oil needed fewer workers, which meant that overall the number of naval personnel on the ship decreased. So that meant the weight of the ship decreased, which means you could carry even more oil. And oil had twice the energy density of coal, which meant that the ships could stay at sea for even longer periods of time. Now, one of the problems that Churchill had was that England had an incredible abundance of coal. And that's among the reasons that England was the first country to march into the Industrial Revolution. So what Churchill did is he noticed they had no oil. So this is the history, or really the first, the first part of our history, where English moved into the Middle East to access oil that was abundant in the area of the Middle East today that we call Iran. And in 1914, one month before beginning the First World War, Churchill secured a 51% controlling interest in the Anglo-Persian Oil Company for a paltry sum of 2.2 million pounds at the time. And that was the first company ever to mine oil in Iran. And it mined oil for the sole purpose of shipping that oil to England so all of the English naval ships could be powered by oil which gave them military superiority over the Germans and is among the reasons some credit Churchill with masterminding the English victory in World War I over the Germans. Following on the heels of Churchill's decision, President William Taft, shown here, U.S. President from 1909 to 1913, he became keenly aware of the need for the U.S. Navy to transition from coal to oil. He knew by Churchill's example that oil generates twice the energy, ships could travel farther, ships could travel faster, and so he all of a sudden wanted to understand what were the domestic resource availability of oil in the United States. Now, unfortunately for Taft, in 1897, the U.S. government had enacted what we call the Oil Placer Act of 1897, which gave individual citizens within the United States the right to search for oil on federal land. And if you found it, you could extract it, you could sell it, you could keep all the revenue, and you could patent the land. So almost identical to the Mining Act of 1872. Well, this was a problem. So when Taft and the Secretary of the Interior started looking around the United States for oil, what they noticed around the United States was in places like Wyoming, and this is Los Angeles in Southern California, they noticed that oil was being produced on federal land and that much of that land was being patented by private citizens, and in essence, that eliminated the amount of oil that the federal government could extract and make available for defense purposes. So it's hard to imagine today, but if you looked at parts of Los Angeles in the 1920s and 1930s, on the bottom, bottom left, this is Hancock Park, a beautiful part of Los Angeles today with these beautiful palm trees. And on the bottom right is Venice Beach, just west of Los Angeles today. If you look at the black and white photographs on the top of your screen, this is what they looked like a hundred years ago. Each one of these oil derricks that you see here, think of that as a drilling rig where a pipe extends into the subsurface and extracts oil. And all of these were owned by private citizens or by private companies. So the federal government became extremely concerned that in the case of war, and now remember Taft is leading into World War I, that in the case of war, the United States Navy would not have access to oil 
and they wanted access to oil because it had twice the energy density of coal, it allowed ships to travel faster and farther before they needed to refuel, it required less manpower, and it generated less smoke, and so therefore you were less visible on the world's oceans. So President Taft, and please don't read everything on the right, I just put it here in case some of you are into public policy or law and want to read it. In 1909, <coughs> President Taft issued an order referred to as the Temp Temporary Petroleum Withdrawal Number 5, which withdrew 3 million acres of public land in California and Wyoming from any availability to oil producers. So in essence, it was a reverse land grab. The federal government had created an act in 1897 encouraging individual citizens to mine oil and patent the land. And in 1909, President Taft said, oops, we made a mistake. My temporary petroleum withdrawal number five order is now going to take that land back and it will belong to the federal government. As a result, one of the oil companies, Midwest Oil Company, they continued to drill and to produce oil on seized land. And the U.S. government sued them for the land and also to recover the oil and the revenues. That case made it all the way to the Supreme Court. And in 1917, the case that is now famously known as the United States versus Midwest Oil was heard by the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court found for the U.S. government in a five to three split that the federal government could in fact take that land back because it served strategic national defense purposes. And following that act in 1914, there were a number of iterations of what ultimately became the Mineral Leasing Act of 1920, signed into law in 1920 by President Woodrow Wilson. And by the way, if any of you are into law, this case is still used as case law in cases around the United States because it serves as a primary example of the federal government being able to use eminent domain to, to retake land ownership for the purpose of national defense or in the public interest. And there's lots of great material that's been written on this. This is just one example if you want to read this on your own time. So now we have the Federal Mineral Leasing Act of 1920 used for these resources here, including oil. And that Leasing Act of 1920 applies to 570 million acres of federal land that are open for oil and gas leasing in the United States, including Alaska. And importantly here, I want you to know that this is federal land on dry land. It also applies to 56 million acres on private land where you might own a house on the surface, but the federal government owns the oil or gas below the surface. Now, how do people get access to extract the oil or gas below the surface on, fed on, on land where the federal government owns the resources below the surface? Similar to what we talked about earlier, you file a claim. And you file the claim with the federal government, which gives you exclusive use of the area once they approve the claim. Now, there are some differences between the Mineral Leasing Act of 1920 and the Hard Rock, hard rock Mining Law of 1872. You're required to pay what's called an upfront bonus bid of $2 an acre. So for all the acreage that you want to claim, you multiply that by two acres. And then if your claim is approved, you pay an annual rent of $1.50 per acre for the first five years and $2 per acre thereafter. So again, a paltry sum to have access to land below which are resources worth lots of money. Now, these bids used to be non-competitive. And the reason I'm going to highlight that here is when they were non-competitive, there were lots of examples of graft or collusion where individuals would get together and bribe federal government officials so that the bribe would guarantee you would have your claim approved. As a result of lots of legal cases into the middle of the 20th century, all of this process now is competitive, meaning that multiple individuals, 
or multiple companies have to file a claim for the same area and the federal government then does their due diligence evaluates each of the various claims and the claimants and then makes a decision as to who should actually have the claim approved and they're supposed to do this thinking in terms of what is in the best interest of the federal government for that particular resource. The time period for claims is 10 years for oil and gas and you can have that claim extended as long as you are doing what's called diligent drilling. So as long as you can demonstrate that you're actually actively exploring for oil and gas then the federal government will extend that claim. And notice the acreage. One person or entity can hold almost 250,000 acres of federal oil and gas leases in any one state at the same time. So among multiple states, you could have nearly 250,000 acres in each of those multiple states. You pay a royalty to the federal government. So again, this is a distinct difference between the Mineral Leasing Act of 1920 and the Mining Law of 1872. The Mining Law of 1872, you pay no royalties, whereas here, the Mineral Leasing Act of 1920, you pay a royalty that varies between 12 and 25 percent to the federal government. Now, what is the royalty? Here's how the royalty works. If you file a claim on land, and below that land is oil, and you start mining that oil, and you sell that oil for $100 a barrel, just assuming, a hypothetical sales price. You sell that oil for $100 a barrel, and then you pay back all of your costs. You have to pay all your workers, you pay all your truck costs, you pay all of your operations and maintenance. Let's say you end up with $50. That $50, initially, you would think, is your profit. But that $50 is where you pay your royalty. So if you have to pay a 25% royalty on $50, you would pay 25% of $50. If you have to pay a royalty of 12%, you would pay 12% of that $50 as a royalty to the federal government. So the royalty here is defined as the tax you pay only on the profits after you have covered all of your costs. Importantly, the federal government returns almost half or 48% of that royalty back to the state in which the oil or natural gas or coal or potash has been extracted. Now, one question you might have then is why would the federal government give some of that money back to the states? I'm going to introduce some other terms and then describe a little bit here what is a bonus bid, why are they competitive, what does that mean, and I want to just show you that here with data. So on the x-axis we've got time from 1955 through 2013 and on the y-axis we have billions of dollars. Now bonus bids were built into the Mineral Leasing Act of 1920 as a way of making individuals or companies demonstrate by paying cash up front they put that cash in with their claim application, which gave a greater degree of seriousness to their claim. And what you can see here is that as a function of time, bonus bids you can see around 1968, in that one year, $5 billion worth of bonus bids were submitted with claims. And then you can see bonus bids tanked. And the reason that bonus bids tanked here is this was an era when we had an OPEC embargo or the oil producing and exporting countries around the world had an embargo of oil to the United States and as a result there was a global oil shock and that sent oil prices haywire and there was a lot less action with respect to oil mining in the US so don't worry about all the ups and downs per se here I just want you to get a sense of bonus bids and that these are paid as part of your claim application and you can see that they roughly correlate with prices of oil not shown here but trust me and you can see that they're incredibly variable over time now I mentioned what a royalty is and how it's calculated here are the royalties over that same period of time from 1955 to 2013 and again just to reiterate 
Royalties are the tax that you pay to the federal government as a percentage of the profit that you make after covering all of your operations and maintenance costs for extracting oil or natural gas. So you can again see the y-axis is billions of dollars. And all I want you to see is that in any given year, there are billions of dollars in royalties paid to the federal government. Compared to our entire federal budget, they are a paltry sum. But depending on where you live, they can actually be a significant source of revenue. And we see that when we look around the United States and where oil and natural gas are being extracted. So currently, as of 2020, there are about 26 million acres of land leased to individuals or companies to develop and extract or mine oil and natural gas. On that land, there are about 94,000 wells and nearly 24,000 that are currently producing oil and gas, distributed almost over 13 million acres. Now, you don't need to memorize the numbers here. I just want you to focus your eyes on the colors. All of these green are areas where we're mining oil and gas in real time as you listen to this. In 2017, the last year for which I was able to get data, the Bureau of Land Management generated about $2.2 billion in federal royalties, rent payments, rent payments, and bonus bids. And all of these are split between the federal government and the states where the oil and natural gas extraction is occurring. And again, here's the question. Why would the federal government give nearly half of the revenue back to the states where the resources are extracted? The reason here is that it encourages the states to allow oil and natural gas extraction to happen. So here we have the state of Wyoming, and I haven't talked about coal yet, but I just want you to focus on this county in northeastern Wyoming. That part of Wyoming is among the leading producers of coal on the planet, and that county right here, if you look at the right-hand side of the screen, you can see the county revenue in 2017. That county received from the federal government almost $500 million in revenue from mining. And so it's extremely important for different parts of the United States. Here's Alaska. And again, I don't need you to memorize the dollar figures. But again, just notice that in Alaska, Alaska is a resource-rich state and 48% of all of the royalties paid to the federal government are returned to Alaska. Here we've got North Dakota, and again, if you look at Western North Dakota, you can see by the state and county that more than $100 million was returned to one particular county from the resources, paid, from the royalties paid for the extraction of resources, in this case, oil. And another one here, we're looking at Oklahoma, and again, if you look to the west of Oklahoma towards the Panhandle, where it sits adjacent to Texas, just notice the amount of money. On an individual county, city, state basis, the 48% of royalties returned can be extremely important sources of revenue. Now, that's onshore extraction managed by the Bureau of Land Management. What about offshore extraction? So all I want you to see here is that if we move offshore, here we're moving offshore the Atlantic Ocean, and over here we're moving offshore the Pacific Ocean. And again, we've got offshore Alaska on the bottom left, where Alaska has obviously been moved for the purpose of showing it on this map. All of the offshore areas in white on the Atlantic and Pacific sides of the United States, those are areas where there is currently no extraction of oil or gas or exploration allowed. All of the areas that are colored here in the Gulf of Mexico, purple is currently off limits, but green, there is oil and natural gas production and exploration. North of Alaska, there is currently a moratorium on offshore exploration, and I'll touch on that. All of these offshore areas of the United States are operated by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management which is another arm of the United States Department of the Interior that manages the offshore energy resources all the way out to the outer continental shelf.
So we've got the Bureau of Land Management managing onshore, and we've got the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management operating offshore. And in terms of the federal government, this is defined as all lands beyond three nautical miles from shore, except in Texas and Florida, where those states have different rules applied to them by the federal government. And I don't need you to memorize these distances. The Bureau of Ocean Energy Management manages about 1.7 billion acres of land. And remember, this is land at the bottom of the water column in the ocean. And there currently are about 8,000 active leases of that federally owned offshore land. There are about 36 million acres that are currently leased and as of 2020, those 36 million leased acres account for about 10% of all natural gas production in the United States and about 25% of domestic oil production. So less than the oil and gas mined on dry land, but not insignificant. So similar to what we talked about with the Mining Law of 1872 and the Mineral Leasing Act of 1920, individuals or companies submit an application to lease individual blocks of land that are about nine square miles and the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management typically offers about 9,000 tracts of land per year and they do this usually a few times a year and one of the things that's different here is that companies are actually allowed to conduct small-scale exploration studies before they submit a bid on a lease. And that is done because the overall cost of exploration and development of oil and gas reservoirs in the Gulf of Mexico or off the coast of Alaska or elsewhere are significantly more expensive than they are on dry land. So the federal government allows companies to, at their own expense, not the government's expense, the federal government allows private companies and individuals at their expense to do some amount of exploration so they have some baseline data to know whether or not they want to bid on a particular lease. If we look at leases in terms of the oil that's been generated over the last 80 years, on the y-axis here are millions of barrels of oil, and all I want you to see is that over the last 80 or so years following World War II, the amount of oil generated on federal leases has risen almost year over year. Minus, we have a couple of drops here following the OPEC embargo in the early 1970s. There was a big oil price drop here in the late 1980s. We saw here the global recession where we had the mortgage crisis in the United States. So again, major world impacts on the ability to extract oil in the United States onshore and offshore. And at the bottom here, I show state leases. And again, states like Texas and Louisiana, they control access to oil and gas within the first few kilometers of the coastline. And one of the things that you can see here in these data is those oil and natural gas revenue resources have been tapped out. So there effectively is no more oil and natural gas close to the coastlines. It's all moving further offshore. And you can see that here in this map where colors are used to indicate the depth of water. So all I want you to see here is we've got the states of Texas, Louisiana, and Texas and Louisiana border the Gulf of Mexico. And if we go back to 1950, Almost all of the oil and natural gas extraction in the Gulf of Mexico was very close to dry land. And as a function of time, those, close, th those resources here in shallow waters have been exhausted. And mining companies, oil and gas mining companies, have moved further offshore. And when you get to the purple areas, those are what we call ultra-deep water greater than 5,000 feet. So you're in water that's more than a mile deep. And another thing you're looking at here is the finite nature of these oil and natural gas resources, something we've talked about in a previous lecture. It takes nature millions to tens of millions of years to form an oil or natural gas resource, and humans are extracting oil and natural gas at a much faster rate 
then nature replaces it. Here is another map, and I just want to make a few points going towards the end of the lecture. All of the areas in red are currently where mining companies are not allowed to do exploration or extraction of oil or natural gas. That doesn't mean that oil and gas are not there. So as I've indicated up here with the box around the word undiscovered, geologists can estimate a significant quantity of oil and natural gas off the coasts of California, Oregon, and Washington, and here in the East Coast, off the coasts of Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, New Jersey, New York, uh, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Maine. The BBL in each one of these is billions of barrels, and the TCF is trillions of cubic feet, and you don't need to memorize the numbers. But just know that there are estimates of significant quantities of oil and gas off the coasts of the western and eastern United States. But right now there is a moratorium on accessing that oil or natural gas because of concerns about potential negative impacts on the ocean ecosystem, which we can all remember perhaps when we think about the deep water horizon a decade ago. It doesn't mean that there's not pressure being put on the federal government to allow access to these areas. So this is from a newspaper article four years ago. And this is an article that focuses on oil and gas companies pushing the federal government to allow drilling in areas off the northern slope of Alaska. They're currently is extraction of oil and natural gas very close to the shoreline in northern Alaska and on the coast and all of that oil is actually piped all the way south back to southern Alaska where it's put on tankers and distributed around the world. Obama when he was still president he did issue final regulations that governed the ability of companies to do oil and gas exploration and what he required, as I highlight in bold on the right side of the screen, are extensive contingency plans that would perhaps not guarantee, but that would put into writing and demonstrate financial backing that if any negative environmental degradation occurred, that the companies would be able to rapidly clean up that environmental degradation. And this is what that area looks like. So if you Google this, you'll find tremendous pushback because these are parts of, in this case, the Beaufort Sea, which is in the southern part of the Arctic Ocean here bordering Alaska and Canada. These are considered pristine aquatic ecosystems. So very similar to what we talked about with respect to the Pebble Prospect and the salmon fisheries and how pristine those areas are. This is an area that has been at the forefront of social license and the opposition to allowing exploration. This is a large drilling rig that the international company Shell towed to the Arctic and spent several billion dollars drilling for oil and natural gas and came up dry and now has abandoned plans for that area. And this is what I mean by social license. When Shell was towing their drilling rig, by the way, this is Seattle with the Space Needle here in the background. When Shell was towing their drilling rig, and you can see all of the tugboats here pulling it out to the ocean, there was tremendous outpouring of support against this. So social license here plays another factor, and mining companies are finding it increasingly difficult to get the social license to operate new oil and gas projects in waters around the United States and for that matter waters around countries around the world. It doesn't mean there's not an effort to make it happen. And President Trump shown here when he took office he signed new legislation encouraging oil and natural gas companies to do just that. Let me come down here. I can't remember if I've got a clip here or just an image. 
that's not playing well. Let's go back and see if I can start that over and it plays better. All right, that's not playing well. I'm just going to abandon that. But I'll tell you what happened. Trump opened up many of these areas shown here off the coast of the Atlantic Ocean, off of Florida and the West Coast. And immediately one of the things that happened is even states with strong Republican governments, overwhelmingly conservative Republican constituencies, immediately pushed back. And the reason is residents of Western Florida, Eastern Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, they don't want to see offshore coastline essentially blighted or contaminated with oil rigs. So almost as soon as President Trump signed new legislation to stimulate new exploration and oil and natural, natural gas development, it was nipped in the bud by individual states because even Republican governors recognized they didn't want the potential negative impacts of offshore oil and gas drilling. So the, the final type here of entry to U.S. federal land is solar and wind infrastructure. And again, this is something you worked on in one of your recent modules when you looked at the amount of solar that could be generated on land owned by the University of Michigan, the amount of solar that DTE could generate in their southeastern Michigan region. And all I want to highlight here is that this is a new type of entry. And these are solar fields here on the left and a large wind farm on the right. These are examples of renewable energy infrastructure built on federal land. In the case of the left, we're in Palm Springs, California, and the right here, we're in Oregon. And similar to what we've talked about already, there are fee structures in place. So there are fee structures for onshore solar and wind and offshore solar and wind. You can see that there's a bonus bid that's paid. You pay rent. And then Interestingly here, remember I said there's no royalties paid for hard rock mining. There are royalties paid for, for oil and natural gas and other resources legislated under the Mineral Leasing Act of 1920. There are no royalties paid for onshore solar and wind, but you pay a fee depending on how much capacity you build. And that's what's referred to here as the megawatt capacity. So just think of this as the larger your renewable energy infrastructure, the more wind turbines you have, the more solar panels you have, the larger your fee. And then if you compare that to offshore wind, you can see that a bonus bid is required. It's also competitive leasing. So multiple companies, at least two, have to put a bid in and then the federal government assesses the pros and cons of each of the bids. You rent the land. You do not pay a fee but you pay a royalty of 2% of the anticipated value of the wind energy. So when wind energy developers are building offshore wind projects, and even onshore wind projects for that matter, they do that after spending years collecting data on wind speeds and directions, and they can anticipate how many gigawatt hours they will produce, and then they will pay a percentage of the value of that to the federal government. So this is the newest access to federal lands and its renewable energy infrastructure. So the last question I want to ask here is when the federal government allows individuals or companies to file a claim to extract resources on land owned by the federal government or on private land, but beneath that private land, the federal government owns the resources, do you think any money should be paid in the case there's an environmental impact that we don't want? And the answer is yes. The Bureau of Land Management, Oil and Gas Management, they require that individuals or companies pay what's called a bond. And a bond you can think of as cash that you put down, and the government holds that while you're actually extracting the resource. So on the left, this is a photograph of natural gas infrastructure being developed in Wyoming. And on the lower right is a small scale pump jack or skip jack mining oil. And these are the dollar amounts that are required. And I don't need you to memorize the dollar amounts. I just want to make an important point. These bonds 
mean that if you have one lease, you pay $10,000. If you have lots of leases in one state, you pay $25,000 for all of your leases. And if you have lots of leases in lots of states, you pay a total of $150,000. That's it. Now, the federal government holds this, and until you do reclamation, you cannot get your bond money back. So one of the big questions is, are they enough? And the answer is, in many cases, yes, because many mining operations, they are able to mine the resource and reclaim the land without in any way negatively impacting the environment. But when there are disasters, and unfortunately there are more than there should be, there should hopefully never be any, when there are environmental disasters, the bond payments are never enough because we know now that the overall cost to clean up environmental degradation when mining goes wrong always exceeds these dollar figures. And it's the same for offshore. So imagine the case here where we have the deep water horizon that has caused tens of billions of dollars of negative impact on the aquatic ecosystem and the economies of all the states surrounding the Gulf of Mexico BP had to pay a total development lease of $3 million compared to tens of billions of dollars of environmental damage. So both onshore bonds and offshore bonds, which are ostensibly to pay for environmental restoration in the case of degradation, when mining goes wrong, the amount of money in the bond is never enough. And this is an ongoing concern and there are lots of environmental groups pushing Congress to change the way that bonds are valued. There are lots of newspaper articles that talk about this. This is just one example from a newspaper in Wyoming last year. And the focus of this article is on oil and gas operators that have essentially abandoned wells throughout Wyoming, saddling citizens and the government of Wyoming with all of the cleanup costs and there are not enough. So at the bottom here, the GAO, the Government Accounting Office, they indicate that as much as 84 to 99 percent of current bonds are insufficient, meaning that 84 to 99 percent of all of the bonds for mining on all federal lands onshore and offshore are not enough money to clean up the damage that occurs because of mining, if damage occurs. So my last slide here just focuses on other countries. I know this was a US focused or US centric lecture. Just one, one thing I'll mention here is what we call crown ownership. Throughout much of the world, mineral resources, similar to what I've described with the federal government, fall under what we call crown ownership where the mineral rights for all resources, hard rock, oil, gas, are held by the government. So countries such as Spain, Mexico, France, England, Australia, the government controls or has sole authority to all of the resources below the surface. So very similar, if not identical, to what I described here today for the way that the U.S. federal government controls access to oil and natural gas and potash and other resources on or beneath federal land. Many people think that crown ownership is problematic because it denies citizens of those countries the ability to generate their own revenue. But in most of those countries, the data indicate that having federal ownership is a good thing because that puts into place legislation that requires a very strict permitting process requires bonds to be paid even if they may not be enough if environmental degradation happens. But nonetheless, there's a central owner of all of the resources. And that's it.